do not understand white supremacy, what it is, and how it works, everything else that you do understand will confuse you. In all of these nine areas of activity, economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war, anywhere on the planet, minute by minute, day by day, all of the time, all of the time, all of the time. Good morning and welcome to the March the 22nd, 2022 edition of the Counter Racist Code Show, also referred to as the CRCS. With Mr. Neely Fuller Jr. and I am your co host, Mr. Bobby. Thank you for listening. Have a good program scheduled for you today with your uh, calls and uh, your comments, which we refer to as VGQ. And you can join the program by calling this number, 516 453 9921. And if you want to ask a question, just press the number one button and then wait. When the call screener comes online, please, ma'am, please, sir, give your name and um, so that I can read your name when I come across. Or if you want to, as some people do, you can just listen to the program and that will be fine also. Uh, let's see here. You can also Gmail me at the numeral number seven, Mr. Bobby, B O B B Y at Gmail dot com. You can do that. Or you can also join the chat room by going to blogtalkradio dot com. You want to go to the listing of programs, click on the Produce Justice Show. When you click on that, then another little box will come up where you can join the chat room and you can enter uh, in there and ask uh, questions or join the uh, the chatters as constructive actions has has already done this morning and one thing about constructive actions their contribution uh, to producing justice to get uh, <clears throat> constructive results is they give you a review of last week's show I like that that way you can go through and any questions you have with that, you can join the chatters. And occasionally I will read a chat or two, and we can go from there. So we, those are good. As a matter of fact, he just did that. <laughs> Thank you, Constructive uh, Actions. Uh, let's see here. Oh, yes, this is important, and I'll make it again in the second hour. Mr. Fuller will be on again this week on the Carl Nelson Show on Radio Terrestrial Radio Station WOL in Washington, D.C., 1450 on the AM dial, 95.9 on the FM dial. But you can also get it on the Produce Justice uh, website because we have a Facebook account there, and you can just click on that and you can hear the show. That's going to be this Thursday, the 24th of March, from 5 until 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Yes, Mr. Fuller on the Carl Nelson Show. Okay, we can do that. I think that's all the house cleaning that I have to do this morning. Okay, so let me start off by saying good morning, Mr. Fuller, and how are you? Good morning. I'm still learning. Okay. You are still learning. I'll ask you some more questions about your learning experience or what you have gleaned off of the Metropolitan Dailies. For those who do not know that term in journalism, we call that your regular newspapers. I don't know if they do that hardly anymore because everything has gone to um, to the Internet online, but occasionally you'll, you'll have some. But anyway, let's start today's uh, program off by um, this. This comes from... Uh, Brother Cleo, he says this, Dear Mr. Fuller, um, 
having significantly cut back on sweets in your 50s, what does your daily diet mainly consist of, and what does your daily fitness routine consist of? In particular, how many hours do you sleep per day? So let's take the first one. Having significantly cut back on sweets in your 50s, what does your daily diet mainly consist of? Man. Okay. And vegetables of of spinach, mostly in soups. Just about everything that can go into a soup. Squash, beans, uh, lots of spinach, raw spinach comes in the bag and but I put it on the stove top uh, and uh, very seldom do I put corn in there mm-hmm. but leaf, leafy vegetables squash kale spinach and great northern beans pinto beans just about every type of bean kidney beans. Uh, I usually prefer the pintos to the black beans, even though every now and then I have some black beans in there. And uh, I mix them up. Mm -hmm. Great northern, but always some beans. And potatoes. All in a soup. A person might say, well, hey, it looks like you're just dumping every type of food that you ever heard about into a big pot. Well, it comes pretty close to that when it comes to vegetables. Mm-hmm. Every now, type of vegetables you can name. Mm-hmm. And, are those red potatoes or white potatoes, or it doesn't make any difference? doesn't make any difference. I, I, uh-huh. Red and, 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 and white. But, now, you mentioned, you mentioned about spinach. Uh, do you fry that? In uh, uh, olive oil with garlic, or, or, or how do you prepare? No, that? I don't definitely no for no fried nothing. It's stove top water and olive oil, yeah. Okay. Uh, and, uh, and and chicken broth. Chicken broth. Chicken okay. broth, vegetable broth. It's relatively oh. pretty cheap. Okay. And, uh, and it's nutritious. So nutritious. I've been told. Now I'm uh-huh. just trying these things, and I have been for several years now. Okay. Uh, of course, I've had to. I've changed, had to change my diet radically. Okay. Uh, it says, uh, what does your daily fitness routine consist of? Walking when I can. I mean, when you're walking? Uh, when you're... I walk okay. every distance. I walk slowly, but I'm walking. Okay. When I, when I, when I have the time to do it, and it's hard yes. for me to find time to do it. And sometimes I just don't feel up to it. Yes, sir. But, uh, I try to do some walking every day. Okay. Uh, when you get up be around my age, so I've heard and so I've witnessed and so I believe, based on what I've observed of people who didn't last very long at when they got up in my age bracket, and that is, if you don't move, if you don't walk, you'll get to the place you can't. Mm-hmm. I never knew that. I mean, you know, I thought to just, you know, when you get ready to walk, you just walk. But when you uh, get around over 70s and 80s and up in there, you mm-hmm. better start walking. Set up a routine of start walking. Yes, sir. Because if you sit, you get to the place, you get exhausted every time you take a few steps. Mm-hmm. It'll actually get that way. Okay. You just take a few steps and you're ready to sit down again. Mm. You can't go very far. All righty. So we got to get some walking in there. And lastly, uh, how many hours of sleep do you average per day? Well, on account of my sleep patterns are uh, often interrupted and all like that, uh, it, it's hard for me to estimate. But I try to get all, you know, any time I sit down, I fall asleep. Let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> If I'm not reading, and sometimes while I'm reading, I fall asleep. Ain't that the truth? (laughs) Ain't that the truth? (laughs) Okay. All righty. Okay, uh, Cleo, there you go. Mr. Fuller answered your question, and uh, we will um, move on. Thank you, Cleo. Okay. Now, listen, 
uh, as we go on with today's show, remember that we want constructive results of whatever you're going to do. And that means you have to stay focused, meaning what? And you're going to hear this all throughout today's program. You have to follow the logic. Do not follow Mr. Fuller. Do not follow me. Follow the logic. Why? Why do you follow logic? Mr. Fuller, answer that question for people. Why do you follow the logic? Because people are flawed. I don't care how brilliant they're supposed to be or how much they think they know or somebody else thinks they know. You start getting all that applause about, you know, this, that, and other, and giving awards for how much you know. Uh, No, you never know enough. There's an old proverb, and somebody says it's an African proverb. He who does not know one thing knows another. And so you that's why I always say I'm still learning. Yes, sir. They say, well, you're up in age, and you're supposed to there's a whole lot of people who are up in age who don't know much about nothing. And so anytime you start thinking you know quite a bit, you haven't even scratched the surface. Okay. That, that That's my my position on it. It's always something to know. And based on what? Just knowing just to be knowing? No. Millions okay. of problems are plaguing everybody. Yes. So the main thing you want to know is how to solve a problem that you have. Mm-hmm. That you have. How to solve a problem. Black people really know how, need to know that. How do yes, sir. You, I got a problem. Black people got a million problems and more coming down the pike every day. Every day. Okay. All right. So what you want to know is as fast as they come, exactly what to do and what not to do. Okay. And and, and so that, that within itself, we haven't even gotten to the first stage of that. No. Collectively absolutely. and absolutely. individually. Mm-hmm. Just solving okay. problems. That's what it's all about. That's what education is, problem solving. You can't solve a problem you ain't educated, nowhere near. What problems have you solved? That's the question to ask. Yes, sir. As long as I've been on this planet, what problems has Neely Fuller solved? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. They say, well, he's trying. Hey, that's not getting funny cut it. Forget that. Mm-hmm. What problems right. have you solved, Fuller? You've been here a long time. All right, mm-hmm. don't say that you know anything if you can't point to a long list of problems that you have solved nearly full. <laughs> okay, okay. Based on logic, based on logic, cause and effect, based on uh, the the on logic. The uh, Supreme Court nominee, uh, I forgot her first name, Kay uh, J- Jackson, I believe, my Brown Jackson. Based on the based on logic now of how the system of white supremacy works, what do you expect the constructive result of her being nominated to the office or, or to the? Uh, Judge of Supreme Court, what does that suggest? What does the logic suggest that's going to happen? The logic suggests she was appointed there under the system of white supremacy. So the mm-hmm. first thing she should know is that there's going to be a lot of stumbling blocks. Mm-hmm. Getting in no way, just like it probably has been on her route there already. But like we all have to do under compensatory logic, we do the best we can. We go back to the movie at Casablanca. You just do the best you can knowing that whatever you do is not going to be enough. I think hmm. John Kennedy once said that. Uh, he was asked at a press conference, said, well, well Mr. President, a lady asked her, uh, one of the reporters, a female, elderly female, I forgot her name, and she asked John Kennedy, uh, you know, well, well, what has he done, you know, in the last two or three weeks about some problem that came up? And he said, well, it's one thing I'm sure of, I haven't done enough. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And so every black person should take that position on everything. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And so, in answer to your question or comment about the Supreme Court justice, I mean, uh, I would, if I was going to make a suggestion or, or make an observation, I would just say that whatever it is, it won't be enough with all the problems we have, but we do the best we can with what mm-hmm. we have. That's what mm-hmm. Thurgood Marshall said, who was a judge. Yes. He said, how did he want to be remembered? And these are his words, Thurgood Marshall. He said, how do I want to be remembered? I did the best I could with what I had. Hmm. Okay. And, and and I never forgot that, that statement because mm-hmm. that's a statement that I kind of ascribe to. Yes, sir. And I, I, you know, except during those times when I lied to myself. Because sometimes I'm not doing the best that I can with what I have. I could do a little better. Yes, sir. The consensus of the group that, um, when this question was posed to the group that I'm with, the consensus, based on the logic of of the history of white supremacy, the logic was a quote by what the the Reverend Jeremiah Wright once said concerning the preacher when he got ready to speak and took off his watch, and somebody asked, well, what does that mean? And he said, not a damn thing. With that, we'll go to Stephon, Texas. You are in the house. Go ahead with your question for Mr. Fuller. Good morning uh, to to both of you. Mr. Neely Fuller, I have a question for you, and um, I'd like to give a response if I could. The question is, let's say you are taking your walk, as you state, you need to take your walk for exercise. Now, while you're walking, you have a uh, black male and a white male. The white male is a little bit closer to you than the black male who's a little bit farther back. Now, one of these two individuals is going to commit a crime against you. My question to you is, between that white male and the black male, would you be able to determine who's going to commit a crime to you? And what's the likelihood of you knowing which one that is and what would you do? I don't know, but I put distance between me and people as far as the best I can. Distance is the, is one thing that helps out a lot. I used to walk to work in the dark. I used to do that, come from work, uh, right after midnight for about a year when I worked back in the 1950s in Chicago when I came across the Congress Street uh, Bridge. I think that's, that's, that was the name of it. So very dark and lonely. And streets deserted. And then I would get on a late subway car going down to South Wabash Street in Chicago. Now, I wouldn't try that now for sure. But it was bad enough then because everybody said, hey, you're setting yourself up for a, for a robbery, country boy. Because I was right out of the country, I mean, but I'd been in the Army. And kind of foolhardy, really, because I would just say, well, you know, I'm going across the bridge. That's the fastest way to get to the subways in the loop, you know. And so that's where, that's where I'd be headed, so that I'd catch the subway car going to the south side of Chicago from the post office, uh, which was downtown Chicago. But it was dangerous, like Chicago has always had a reputation for being extremely dangerous. I've never heard a time long before I even knew where Chicago was. I heard mm-hmm. stories about Chicago. You go to Chicago, you can have a good time and all like that, but you got to watch your back. I mean, they, mm-hmm. they rob people in daylight up there. Something was un- almost unheard of, you know. Mm-hmm. And the first thing I noticed when I got there, all the buildings, something I'd never seen down in the small town, Muskogee, Oklahoma, where I came from, I'd never seen mm-hmm. just about every building on the lower level, on the first floor level, all the row houses mm-hmm. and everything, they had bars on them in the 1950s where black people were. You could always tell. And another thing, the shades were always down. <laughs> I always knew when I was in a white area, because the shades would be up. 
people just walking around, you know, some of the females look like they were half naked or whatever. I mean, just like they didn't have a care in the world. Why? Safe neighborhood, that's why. No bars on the windows. I noticed that. But you always knew when you were in a black area, bars on the windows. So when I said, even on this program, black people always in jail, we were born in jail. Hey, that's literal if you were in a big city. You are in jail, literally, when you lock all five locks on your door. You know, well, where I came from, people didn't even lock the screen door back then. Well, yeah. that was a different thing in the country because everybody knew everybody. So if you if somebody broke into a house, they say it wasn't nothing but one of those uh, Jones boys or, uh, you know, one of those Thomas boys. You know, there's two of them over there. They're always breaking and entering somebody's house. Mm-hmm. They ain't been here long. I think they came from Kansas City. <laughs> and sure enough, okay. when they arrest them, that's who it would be. Because so everybody they, knew everybody else. They knew the people that did the stealing. So mm-hmm. people didn't okay. steal much. Not because people were all that country good, but they just didn't uh, okay. do it. Okay. Yes, sir. If if I could, real quickly, I wanted to end it with this. As it's my duty and as your servant and the world's top cop. Now, to, to say to you and to your listeners, uh, the way crime is going now, we have to be able to identify when crime comes, even before crime comes your way. And the best way to do that has never been done before. And constructively, I have the solution to everything to make sure to protect you, Mr. Nilly Fuller, to not be a victim of crime and your listeners. And you can learn more of that uh, through the teachings and training uh, through this website that you can go to. It's all one word, www.strategicscsi.com. Thank you, gentlemen. All righty. Thank you, uh, Stefan from East Texas. Well, thank you. Thank you to uh, all the people uh, in the chat room. My girl's in the in town and from the DMV. Rita Triple Eight, yeah. Emery's in there. Uh, double Double N K Glass. Glad you're on board. Roland Randolph. Still learning too in Tucson. Glad you are in. Uh, Corey Milwaukee's best. You're in the house with Mister Fuller. Greetings, gentlemen. Um, I'd like to refer to the 2016 edition, page 62. Okay, 62. Under Area 1, Economic. Okay, wait a minute. Let me get my book here. Okay, 62, okay. The last paragraph on the bottom of the page. All right. um, My question is in reference to the compensatory, compensatory investment request. Um, Mr. Fuller, can you explain, I had experience uh, regarding the situation, Um, can you explain why it is codified for a non-white victim of racism who is still learning and maybe even outspoken about replacing the system of white supremacy with justice? Why is it codified for this individual to receive, for example, public health benefits or disability compensation for going through a disease or something. Why? That's page 262. You say you see something there? No, page 62. 62 of the uh, refined edition. And then your question is what now? Uh, Why is it? Why is it codified for a non-white person to receive, for example, health insurance benefits, disability compensation, if this non-white person is a, a outspoken or advocate who's still learning um, and who is against the system of white supremacy justice? Why is it codified for this person to still receive and make compensatory investment requests? Uh, compensatory investment request and uh, says 
one, now which one are you referring to? Uh, a paragraph where it says number three? Yes. And I'm we'll, trying we'll, to get my mind around what you're yeah. asking. Yes. If 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 a compensatory emergency investment request, if that fall is this health insurance, for example, fall under that or health care? If a non you ask person for everything that you need because we're prisoners of war. I got I, I have to keep repeating that. Now you won't hear that maybe from anybody else on any radio program or in any school, black people are not prisoners of war. I mean, I'm, I'm many professor will say that if somebody says that in a college right now. I contend that we are, every last one of us. We're prisoners of war. And when I say prisoners of war, I mean prisoners of war literally. I don't mean, you know, in some type of metaphoric, you know, way or, or some type of lofty, uh just uh, expression that everything in prisoners of war do what? Beg. That's all you can do. Now we say, oh, no, I work for everything I get. You sure do. If you're black, you, you better be. All right, because that goes with being a prisoner of war, too. You're going to work. Oh, yes, <laughs> one way or another. But you are not going to be compensated like a person who is treated correctly. You're mistreated. No matter how hard you work as a prisoner of war, you're going to be mistreated. That's why I'm saying you can't solve any major problem that black people have without getting rid of the entire system of racism. I still contend that. So that puts black people in what kind of shape? What, what am I announcing? What is our status worldwide right now, right this minute, in March of 2022? Prisoner of war, which means we are beggars. You say, well, I don't beg nobody. I work hard. Well, now you're working hard, and that's begging because you got to beg for the job. you got to beg to get anything if you're a prisoner of war. And we're realistically looking at that. I mean, the job is big. Getting rid of the entire system of racism is big. And when people look at that, uh, people have called in all down through the years on the program to say, well, you make it seem so hopeless. No, the job is just big, that's all. And you just say, well, it's a big job. It's a big job that we got to do. You've got to get rid of racism. Otherwise, nothing's going to work. I don't care what you do. I don't care what you try to achieve, uh, you know, who you contact, how you try to squirm this, and, you know, whether you try to be a business person or, or a gangster, or bring back Wall Street, Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I don't care what you do. you got to get rid of the entire system. Otherwise, you're going to be sorely disappointed and disappointed and disappointed and disappointed. It's no way to squirm around that. The entire system of white supremacy has to be replaced with an entire system of justice flat out. Otherwise, everything within the giant scheme of things that a black person does is, by definition, a failure. According to what? Neely Fuller? No, according to logic. If you're talking about justice, that's not going to happen in the system of white supremacy. It's anti-justice all the way. So you figure out how to take it apart. It's put together by people. Anything put together by people can be taken apart by people. But just because the job is big and scary doesn't say that hasn't, you know, that you got to get around, try to get around getting it done. No, it's big and it's scary, and it seems impossible, but you got to do it anyway. Mm-hmm. All that's, right. That's according to logic. Okay. All right, let's do this. Uh, thank you, Corey. 
The music is playing, so you know what that means. You are now listening to the Counter Racist Code Show with Mr. Neely Fuller Jr., heard here on blogtalkradio.com and also on producejustice.com. We thank you. To get in contact with today's show, just call 516. 516- Four five three nine nine two one. Make sure that you press the number one button if you have a comment or a question. Please, ma'am, please, sir, please make it short. You can also contact the show by my uh, Gmail account, which is at number seven, Mr. Bobby B O B B Y at Gmail dot com. You can do do that, or you can join the chat room by going to Blog Talk Radio dot com. Then you want to click on Shows and uh, the Produce Justice uh, Show. I think this program is actually Produce Justice uh, Show. And then you click that, and then the chat comes up. It's available for you to get on there, and you can get in and on the chat to see what's happening and on the uh, various conversations that are, are going on in there. And speaking about that, someone, I think it was Rudy, 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 Ask about a, a question about um, the situation in Mason, um, Tennessee, which is a black town. I, I suppose I'm not. I don't know that, but I was being told that it's forced to go up their city charter. If anybody has any information on that, please let me know. Have you heard, Mr. Fuller? You read the papers or or other sources that you get your news. Have you heard anything about that? Uh, specifically, what? Uh, the uh, town of Mason, Tennessee, which is uh, 60% blacks, is forced to give up, uh, according to what I'm reading, is forced to give up their city charter. Have you heard anything about that? I haven't heard anything about it. Okay. Okay. Anybody that knows anything about that in the chatters, uh, chat room um, hit me to what's going on, and so we can um, maybe have a discussion about that. I don't know. All righty, ninth, you know what, I'm looking at two numbers, because I was wondering why the music was playing, and I'm looking at the date, which is 322, <laughs> but uh, we're, we're, we're much into that, we're at the 930 mark right now. Uh, let's go to, man, let's go on to Brooklyn, and I'm not talking about Bed-Stuy, even though Tassan is on, hey Tassan, you are in the house, go Nets. I'm a Knicks fan, though. But anyway, go ahead. Hey, I'm a Knicks fan myself, man. There you go. So we got some camaraderie there. There you um, go. Good morning, Mr. Bobby. Good morning, Mr. Fuller. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning I wanted sir. to ask. Good morning. I wanted to ask uh, very quickly, um, Mr. Fuller, attaining wealth in the system of white supremacy is known to compromise the integrity of non-white individuals. If a victim of white supremacy is attempting to produce justice by attaining wealth, would it still be codified if your integrity was compromised, if the end goal is to produce justice? Well, your integrity, uh, what does that mean? Um, You know, normally... Well, okay, producing wealth meaning like having asset, uh, having access to a lot of things and or money, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, correct? Right, that the white supremacy. That's what we usually associate with wealth, accumulating large sums of money and or quote, unquote, property and or things that can be used to solve problems. You consider that wealth. So the question is, What? If I'm trying to get your question. Oh, yeah. The question would be, um, I guess maybe integrity is not the best word. If you if you were, I guess, essentially, let's say, uh, if have you ever read the spook that sat by the door? Are you familiar with that? I think I read it, but I forgot most of what was in it. Uh, do you? The, now, by integrity, you mean... I've heard people use that word, and it's used in a different type of con- different type of contexts. So, I would I would have to know what do you mean specifically? What does a person do when their integrity is compromised? 
uh, for example? Uh, for example, you mean um, you became you wealthy mean, by doing something that did harm to people yes, who shouldn't be harmed? Yes. Oh, yes, okay. Now, not, see, that's yes. what that's uh, see. Words have meaning. See, so we have to know. Uh, we have to be very specific in counter racist science about what we mean when we say something. So it means Neely Fuller, for example, is going to make. $40 million overnight, but in the process of doing so, he's going to destroy the futures of, say, 2,000 black people, for example. Now, that's very specific. Neely Fuller is going to make $40 million, but for 2,000 black people, they're going to be sacrificed on account of what he's going to do in order to make it. All right? He's going to say they'll throw away people. Well, yes. that w- You're not supposed to do that because the code says you're trying to replace the system of white supremacy with what? The system of justice. So the question is, Is that just? Is that producing justice? The answer is no. Why? Because of the compensatory definition for justice. The key word here is harm. You can't do harm to anyone (coughs) except to someone who's doing harm to someone else. You stop them from doing the harm. That's it. But if you do harm to someone who should not be harmed, in order to get what you want, that's non just. See, so if you can make $40 million without hurting people who shouldn't be hurt, then that, that, that's the way you go about doing it. But it's very difficult to do in the system of white supremacy because the system of white supremacy is set up that, hey, if you're black and you want to what they call be successful, they set you up. Say, now you're going to have to throw a whole lot of black people under the bus in order to get what you want as an individual. Now, are you willing to sign on for that? So that's that's the moment of decision. Mm -hmm. That's for you to decide. That's Mm -hmm. your uh, Rick Blaine moment, if you go back to the movie Casablanca. Because the character in the movie Casablanca was faced with that almost every minute of every day. And a lot of black people are faced with that almost every minute of every day, wherever they happen to be on the planet. Mm -hmm. They tell people in Africa all the time, say, now you can be a president of this country, all right? You're running for president, male or female, the president of Liberia or president of Haiti. You can be that, but you're going to have to throw a whole lot of your own people under the bus in order to get the position that you want and ride around in a limousine all day, all right, and wave at people. But you're going to have to do a lot of harm to a lot of people. Now, take it or leave it. So that's a decision for you to make. Hmm. All righty. Looking for constructive results. Thank you, Tassant. From uh, the city Uh, Mr. Fuller There's a question here Uh, Nancy I believe it says This right here says um, Outside of black people Is it logical Mr. Fuller To include other non-white groups In code To quote Dr. Henry Clark Quote Black people you have no friends End of quote All the evidence points to other non-white groups either collectively mistreating black people or not helping to produce justice. Mr. Fuller? Black people mistreat black people. Around the clock, every day, all day, look forward to mistreating black people. We've been trained that way. We know Mm -hmm. that better than anything else. We know how to do that better than anything else. We talk all that love stuff. But there ain't nothing to it. Nothing. Zero. And our record shows it. 
No, we haven't figured out how to even talk to each other in a decent manner. All talk between black people should be decent talk. I mean, super over the top. Every time we talk to each other, hugs and high fives are no substitute for justice. Now, we, we put on a show, and we talk about love more than anybody on the planet and can't stand nothing that comes anywhere close to doing, trying to do a little bit of justice among ourselves so we can, you know, make a complaint about some person who is labeled as Arab, wasn't courteous to us, in the grocery store, well, he just looks at, he or she looks at how we talk to each other and, and how we treat each other and all that gunfire that people running in and out of his store chasing, black people chasing each other through the store, opening fire. And here's a little fellow from Hong Kong, I mean, trying to get his children to scramble out of the way. I mean, and everybody's always talking about him and how he cheats people and how he does that and all like that. He usually, on the average, treats black people better than black people treat black people, all of his customers, better than they treat each other. That fellow that runs that little small store where people come in and, and steal stuff off the counter all day, and he's got to run them out. He, he learns a lot of them by, the, by their names and all like that. Uh, and he gets tired of it. And sometimes he's got an attitude because that's what brings it on. Or he comes there with an attitude because he's so, now when you open your little store there, you got a whole lot of people who are coming in there and they are not going to do uh, be nice to you. They're, they're going to try to do things to you and do harm to you. So you be braced for that. You better put in, if you're going to be around these people, you came here from a distant land, and if you're going to get along with these people, you have to get along with them by a whole lot of barbed wire and whatnot and hmm. bulletproof glass because they are very destructive, very <laughs> They're destructive with each other. They're destructive with anybody that they come around. And they, they've gotten to the place where they enjoy it. Mm -hmm. All right? Now, that's the kind of label we have worldwide, that we have copied everything that's destructive from everybody that we have seen on the planet who is destructive. And when it comes to anything con constructive, we avoid it like a plague. We've been trained that way. Yes, sir. That's one of the worst things that the white Supremes, if not the worst, have done to black people. They are guilty of that all the way, and they know it. And they know it, yes, sir. They trained us to love being gangsters. Hmm. And then they condemn us for being what they trained us to be. We yeah, should never forgive them for that. I say that. That's just my suggestion. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, that's, no, you don't yeah. get no forgiveness for that. <laughs> you trained us from birth to be thugs and then call us thugs after you trained us to be thugs and set up everything for us to be thugs. And so that's <laughs> what we have turned out to be, some pretty rotten people. <laughs> and you laugh at us for being that way. But you gave birth to us. We have been mm -hmm. under your tutelage before we were born, when we were in the womb. And I'm saying that to the whole white supremacist world. Mm -hmm. now, they don't, now they're talking about critical race theory. No, it's not. You know, hey, tell the truth. Tell the truth. Tell the truth. <laughs> exactly. Who raised us other than you? Exactly. <laughs> the real pandemic. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Fuller, uh, it is time to discuss your book. Take it away.
Yes, well, the things that I'm saying right now are in the book, in one way or another, but not only the things that are the problem. I wrote my book with the intention. Somewhere along the way, I didn't start out doing that. I was just starting out trying to figure out just how to get through the day and still be breathing and, and have a little of what you might call progress, whatever that means. But I decided somewhere along the way, get rid of the entire system of racism and stop just picking around the edges of it. So that's what I wrote the book for. And I wrote it not for organizations, even though organizations can use it, because organizations, black organizations, are limited in what they can do. But the individual person has less limitations. The white supremacists can't watch everybody all the time, not every individual. So if the theory is, if you solve the problem of each individual black person on the planet, you're solving the problem of every individual black person on the planet. So I tried to address everything to the individual person, not to families, groups, etc. you know, because the white supremacists can control any black group in their prison system. They know who the groups are, and the entire system of white supremacists is a prison system. So I wrote my book about how to erode the system of white supremacy and replace it with a system of justice, which means guaranteeing that no person is mistreated and guaranteeing that the person that needs help the most gets the most constructive help, and how each individual person, by his or her thought, speech, and action, can do this worldwide, adopt a code that will do that, an individual code. You don't have to check and see what somebody else is doing. You just know what the code requires you to do, and you do it. What to say, what not to say, what to do, what not to do, in every situation you find yourself in. And that will solve the problems of the entire world eventually. And the faster you can do that, the faster it will happen. And uh, I wrote the book with that in mind. Mm Mm-hmm called a textbook, workbook for thought, speech, and our action for victims of white supremacy. That's the more explicit title of the book. And you can get the book? How to do this each and every day, wherever you happen to be on the planet. You can get it by going to producejustice.com. Okay. It's two volumes, but it's supposed to be one volume because you have a word guide. What to say, what not to say, what questions to ask when other people are talking. Okay. All righty. Producejustice.com. Producejustice.com. That's where you can get the book. Uh, Response to a question that was asked earlier about Mason, Tennessee. Now, I don't know about Mason, Tennessee, but I did hear a, a story about a town called Mason, Ohio. Uh, which is a few miles north, maybe 30 miles north of the city of Cincinnati, Ohio. And I understand it's the black town. So, Roland, check that out to see if it's Mason, Ohio, or Mason, Tennessee. But anyway, this is the situation concerning the Masons. The town is 60% black. It's facing the um, forced relinquishment of their city charter, due to financial mismanagement. The city was was ran ran by suspected white supremacists who ran the city's financial into the ground. But suddenly, since Ford Motor Company has decided to place a plant next to the town, the state comptroller wants to seize Mason from the black municipal staff and citizens' control. The comptroller... um, Mr. Munpower is blatantly denying that the seizure is due to the possibility of a financial comeuppance for Mason, Tennessee. It's really 
astounding. Yeah, check that out for me to see if it is Mason, Tennessee, or Mason, Ohio, because I heard the story on on the BIN, the Black Information uh, Network, which is, um, I, I think it's in about 47, 48 cities that you can get. All news that they have on there is, is pertinent for our black folks. So somebody check that out because we don't want to give out any er- erroneous information you know, about that. But I did hear a story about that, and that's not unusual because if you understand what happened to the Freedmen's Bank, the same thing happened after the Civil War. Uh, the Freedmen's Bank was established to assist the black uh, so, so-called freed uh, slaves, into, including Frederick Douglass, by the way, um, into a, uh, a banking so that they could buy land and so forth because the basic skill they had was sharecropping. But anyway, uh, after so many years, I think it was nine, the bank suddenly uh, went under because the people who were in charge were uh, white people who are suspected white racists who uh, – did something to the fund, and so and the government just took the uh, bank away. Now there's another bank that's on the rise called One United Bank, which is a black bank that I'm investigating right now. But anyway, somebody check those stories out and see if they are are going on par to see what's going on, so that we can be informed properly because we need proper information. Ray Dallas, man, you're in the house. Okay, Ray, got gotcha. you. Good morning, gentlemen. I have two questions that time allows. Um, number one, Mr. Fuller, could the compensatory code have been constructed amongst a group of non-white people who have not had significant time amongst the white supremacists? Who have not had what? Significant time amongst the white supremacists. Oh, and they they can make a compensatory code? And they haven't um, had no. significant time. Yes, sir. Yes, I'm asking if could the compensatory code have been constructed amongst a group of non-white people who have not spent a significant amount of time amongst the white supremacists? I don't know, but the more you know about the people who tell you what to do, well, knowledge is power. So you know about how to uh, get things done and the best way to go about doing things. It's familiarity, uh, knowledge, understanding. The more you understand about anything, the better you can handle it. Black people have very little understanding of almost anything in the world that we have been put into. I mean, we have been... uh, they, they didn't allow black people to read for a long time. Uh, reading was something that was forbidden. Or learn how to read or learn how to do anything that you just wasn't told to do directly on the edge of a whip. And that's been all over the world, not just in the northwestern hemisphere. Wherever black people were encountered, they immediately got a whipping when they encountered the white supremacists. That's why they're white supremacists. They did that everywhere they went. Mm-hmm. So it's no such thing as a place. So you learn what you can wherever you happen to be. That's why I keep referring to the movie Casablanca. There's a lot of lessons in that movie. That's my favorite movie of a long list of movies or maybe about a list of about 40 movies that I have on the website. But... That's right. It's not at the top of the list uh, because I put them in sort of a historical order. But uh, Casablanca is my favorite movie. It's a corny movie in many ways. It put the average person to sleep after about 15 minutes who's used to the fireballs and all like that and video games that everybody's used to. But when you look at the lessons in the movie they, and the character in it, Rick Blaine, you do the best you can in answer to the question, wherever you happen to be. And keep it in mind, you're supposed to try to codify every move you make. Now, what do we mean by codify? It means you get the most constructive result out of everything that you say. You don't say there nothing. There it is. Mm-hmm. You don't say anything. 
You know, not one sentence to anybody without stopping and thinking that, now when I say this, is it going to get a constructive result or is it going to make another problem or make a problem that we already have bigger? See, so you should always do that all day long, wherever you happen to be. And then keep your eyes open for, in answer to the caller's question, for learning. Learning from whom? The people who seem to know the most. Try to do that in every situation you're in, whether the person is white, non-white, male, female, whatever. Try to learn. Pick out the people who seem to be, who know the most. Yeah. Who can solve problems and watch how they go about doing everything. And you learn from that rather than mm-hmm. what we have been trained to do. Pick out somebody who, what we say on the street, ain't about nothing and use that as a role model. Yes. Which black people have been trained to do. Exactly. All right. Hey, Nicole from Maryland, check this out. I'm going to get you on the other side when we um, go to the second hour because we are getting ready to wind down the first hour. Mr. Fuller, we've got about two minutes, and, we'll, I, and I want to give you two minutes as we close out the first hour. So what say you in these two minutes, sir? Well, I'm saying that we should make give substance, talking about codification now, to our slogans. I've been trying to keep track of slogans lately, and, uh, and some of them, I got a list of them here. Hold our leaders accountable, and uh, I say, now, what, what does that mean? I've heard that over and over and over and over again, and that's a slogan. A slogan is not the same as a plan. Please, I want people within the sound of my voice to take that into consideration. Every time you hear a new slogan now, uh, and slogans do serve a purpose, but they're like, a slogan is like a fancy-looking book with a fancy cover and a title that catches your eye like you're in a bookstore and you you see a title on a book. How to solve your arthritis problem. It jumps right out at you. And that's, you might say, that a title on a book is a slogan. But when you open the book, you don't want blank pages. And that's what black people have become real expert at. We come up with a slogan about every six or seven months. I mean, it'll be off the charts. Everybody be saying, what does that mean, man? What's that latest slogan? Oh, man, I feel you. I feel you, man. You feel me? These are slogans. Now, I'm not saying slogans don't serve a purpose. Words motivate people. But what is that supposed to mean that's going to produce a constructive result? That's the question. See, slogans have questions behind them. Yes. A title of a book is an introduction to a problem to be solved, or it should be, unless it's a book like mystery novels and all that. It ain't about solving problems, it's about making problems. <laughs> so that's something the white supremacists do. Got us worshiping death like they do. <laughs> that's they, for real. Okay. But hold our leaders accountable. We got to come together. We got to organize. These are slogans. Black Lives Matter. That's the most prominent one in the last two or three years that has taken root. But the ladies even who originated the slogan said, we have to have some plans behind this. We just don't say Black Lives Matter and then, you know, everybody high fives and, and, and does some hugging and then go home. Well, I'll tell I mean, you what. Go ahead. I got to hug it right now because we got to close out the first hour. All right, sir. <laughs> okay, Mr. Fuller. Okay, everybody. Hey, thank you for listening to the first hour for those of you who uh, have to go. We do have another hour 
to go on the CRCS. So again, thank you. If you can, if you can come in next week, and then stay tuned for that. For the rest of us, stay tuned for the second hour of the Counter Racist Code Show with Mr. Neely Fuller, which will begin in seven seconds from now. Alrighty, welcome back to the second hour of the Counter Racist Code Show with Mr. Neely Fuller Jr. I am your co host, Mr. Bobby. We thank you. For listening, for especially for those who have hung on or an extension from the first hour, we thank you very, very, very much. If you would like to get in contact with today's show, and in particular our people from California who are waking up now, just call this number five one six four five three nine nine two one, and be sure to press the number one button if you would like to. Have a comment, or if you'd like to ask Mr. Fuller a question, you can do that. Please, ma'am, please, sir, be brief. Please don't go into all the ana- analytical stuff and just 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 ask your question so we can um, get the question on and and give Mr. Mr. Fuller a chance to um, understand your question and then answer it appropriately. And he will use logic. What do you mean, Mr. Bobby Logic? Cause and effect. That's why he uses the examples, because the one thing that we are trying to avoid is confusion. We do not want confusion, because we're interested in CR, which is constructive results. So stay focused. Stay focused. Okay, you can also... um, Gmail me at the numeral 7, Mr. Bobby, B-O-B-B-Y at gmail.com, and uh, I can't say that it will be read, although we have read a few today. Some of them will be read, and some of them won't. We'll have to go back in the archives and get them before the program deletes them. Hopefully it will not. And you can also join the chat room. Oh, yeah, man, you can get in that bad boy. Woo, Mm, have mercy. All you have to do is go to blogtalkradio.com, And then you want to click on where it says programs? Yeah, right there. Right there. Yeah, that's it. Programs. The counter-racist program. Yeah, that's the one you want to do. Or, uh, excuse me, the Produce Justice Show. What am I talking about here? Nothing. Yeah, the Produce Justice Show. Click that icon, and then the chat room will come up. And, man, you're going to get in there with some people. Chloral Revolution. Yeah, Revolution. Emery Lumamba's in there. Jacoby Tukane is in the house. J.J. just joined the J.J. Keller, Rita Triple Eight. Roland Randolph still learning. There's 11 of them in there. Oh, and if you want uh, what we've been talking about, constructive items, constructive action items. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Gives you a recap of not only today's show, but also in previous shows. That's uh, the contribution they make to producing justice. I know I mentioned last week that Triple Eight, Miss Rita, she has bought some of her coworkers the book, which Mr. Fuller will talk about. Bought them. That's right, the book, and we need that code book to to give us suggestions as to how we can be better at producing justice, which I will have Mr. Fuller talk about later on in the program. Announcement: More Fuller, more Fuller, more Fuller. Yeah, we're gonna get more of him this week. Thursday, check it out, on the Carl Nelson Show. That's right. Mr. Fuller will be on the Carl Nelson Show this Thursday, March the 24th, from 5 until 7 p.m. on Terrestrial Radio Station WOL, 1450 AM and 95.9 FM, all in the DMV. But... Thanks to our wonderful people here at ProduceJustice.com. All you have to do is go to the ProduceJustice.com homepage, and then there's a place for Facebook. You can click on that, and guess what? You can hear the program. That's right. My man, Robert, fixed that up, or somebody did. Maybe Sharon was in on it, too. But anyway, fix that bad boy up so you don't have a problem in picking up the program I listen to it myself because I'm still learning a lot 
from uh, that and even better interview techniques. Thank you, Carl Nelson. I don't even know the brother, but I listen. Yeah. Anyway, that that that's how you can get more fuller. You can't get enough of that. Okay. Let me see. Let me see. What else did I have to do? Oh yeah. Okay. Got him on there. Okay. Let's go back to the phone lines. Some of my old radio days. Wow. That DJ is still in there. Okay, Nicole, get ready because I'm getting ready to press the button. Swa, I see you there. Okay, here we go. Nicole, do your thing. Good morning, Mr. Bobby. Good morning, Mr. Fuller. Good morning, Nicole. Okay, so um, I have a comment, maybe question. So Mr. Fuller always say that we as uh, constituents or people that listen in can um, ask some questions. And so as an elder, I respect him, but it's something I'm going to say that he said permission to do sometimes, which is when he talked about reparations, um, he said before numerous of times that he don't think black people deserve reparations or they don't know what to do with reparations. And to a certain degree, I agree with that, that some people don't. However, with the book and with education and having a plan to change some of the things in our community, I think reparations would help enhance or improve that. Like how you're talking about the black bank. I don't think rep, I think reparations to me and the knowledge that I know would serve a purpose of re-educating my neighborhood in which I live and making it better. So it wasn't a question. It was kind of a comment respectfully to Mr. Fuller. Okay. But would you have a question in there concerning reparations? That way we can kind of shape it into uh, something that he could probably answer, unless you want him to make a comment on what you just said. So if he had a comment, that's fine. But the question, if I had to shape it into a question, would he think that people with education of his book, Dr. Wilson, and amongst other, and I don't want to say reformers, but people that are giving people uh, counter um, resolutions to issues that we're having, do he think that through reparations and the proper um, allocation of that community centers or um, skill-based programs or just adequate courses, do he think that that can cause a ripple effect or change within our communities and change the way that people are thinking to make them better stakeholders within their neighborhoods? Mr. Fuller? Here is an example of miscommunication, which is something that plagues this program, I guess, and all programs, I guess, or when any speaker or any person makes a suggestion, that people hear things that wasn't said. I've never said that black people shouldn't get reparations, ever. Let's get that straight. I'm going to repeat it because I keep repeating this. But people, I don't know where it comes from, say that Fuller says he's against reparations. I have said that I need we need a how we get reparations and what the reparations would consist of has to be very specific and we have an idea of where when we are repaired, reparations means to repair damages done. And I have said that just one shot payoff, now I have spoken against a cash payoff. I say you just give black people a bunch of cash and turn them loose. The white supremacists know all about cash. And they know how to steer cash where they want it to go. Because after you get cash, you've got to do something with it. So I say this plan has got to be from A to Z. Not from A to B or A to C or A to Q. No. We've got to have a complete plan. That's where the repair job, we, got, we need a, a complete repair job. Not just one that's going to go halfway. It's like taking your car to the repair shop. And the person says, well, I'm going to fix your transmission partially, and I'm going to fix your engine partially, and uh, your, your car needs four tires, but I'm going to give you two. And then you go down the road in that kind of condition. 
No, we need a complete repair job. And we're talking about generations now. We're not talking about some one-shot payoff or some showpiece like a black Wall Street. We're talking about we got to repair black people's minds and everything else that has been broken because everything has been broken. There's no part of a black person that hasn't been completely messed up. Our minds have been messed up. So we're talking about people who talked about health on this program, and that comes under economics, time and energy. Black people do have time, and they do have energy. That's all we got. So we need a repair job in economics, meaning the use of our time and energy. I mean, this has got to be well thought out. I mean, some cash payment, a bunch of black people lined up grinning, collecting a check. That's what I said doesn't make sense. And I mean that. We need four things consistently that's got to be for generations. Housing, health care, education, transportation. Now, that's got to be guaranteed. I mean, a roof over your head has got to be guaranteed from the time you were born to the time you die. We're talking about long-term repair. We're talking about a, one of the biggest, most magnificent, most the greatest undertaking, Marshall Plan, uh, uh, Cold War, space uh, explorations, all like that. No, when we start talking about reparations for black people, we're not talking about some little cheap payoff with black people lining up and walking away with just enough money to catch up on a few bills and pay off some college loans and all like that and then call it square after all these generations? No, no, nowhere close to that. And the main thing is mental repair. The education system is nowhere near what it should be. We're talking about a complete overhaul of the entire education system for both white people and black people. I mean, a total overhaul. That's a part of the repair job. We have to be re-educated all together. Mm-hmm. Okay? I mean, we're talking about something that's almost uh, the best minds in the world when you apply them. will be strained to the limit. We're not talking about some cheap shot lining up at some window, talking about give me my check. That's what we are used to. No. When we say repair job on this, all, everything that's been broken, where black people is concerned, are concerned, you're talking about generations of repairs. We're talking about the greatest endeavor ever made by all of the people down to the ages put together in every country. That job is just that big. It's big. So when you so when you talk about Neely Fuller and his comments on reparations, hey, I don't think anybody wants to talk about the level that he's where he's thinking mm-hmm. for reparations. But you're getting it now. Straight dope. Exactly. Yeah, you're getting it now. Yeah, when I say repair job, I'm not talking about some patch-up work, no patchwork at all. No, no. We're talking about a repair job that's the biggest repair job anybody has ever taken on. All over the world, put together down to the millennia. That's the kind of job it calls for. That's what you mean by real repairs. Real repairs, yeah. Repair. How about repair another mind? Thank you, Nicole. Thank you for your comments, your question, and still all this mental masturbation. Oh, it's crazy. Crazy, crazy, crazy. Listen, Fuller, Fuller is on. Yep, 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 yep. Thursday. Put it down. Put it down. Thursday, March 2 4, 24th, 5 until 7. P.M. 
on the Carl Nelson Show in the DMV. 1450 AM, 95.9 on the FM dial. But thanks to Robert and the crew, maybe Moon Pie was in on this too. You got the hookup. Just go to the... You can go to ProduceJustice.com. We got a Facebook link, and it's official. And, man, you can hear that show right there without all that trouble that that uh, some people were having in getting the Carl Nelson show. That is over. Over. You can get it right there. Go to ProduceJustice.com and then clicking on that link on Facebook. And, man, we got the Carl Nelson show right there. And we got Mo Fuller. More of Mr. Fuller right there. I can't hardly wait because I get excited hearing about that, you know. Because one thing that we all must do, even in the chat room, it is important that you not follow Mr. Fuller, you not follow Mr. Bobby, but always follow after the logic. The logic. Follow after the logic, for it will lead you to, to the truth. Follow the logic always. That cuts down on confusion, which we don't want, and will help produce constructive results. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, buddy. Let's go out west, L.A. My man, here he is, the one. Swa! Got you, brother. Go ahead. Good morning. Greetings, Mr. Bobby. Good evening, Mr. Lee for Jr. Uh, my question, Mr. Lee for Jr., is um, for victims of racism, who want a complimentary mate, how do you suggest they go about finding one? For victims of racism doing what? For victims of racism who want a complimentary mate. How do complimentary you mate? A care mm-hmm. mate? Yes, a care mate. How do you suggest they go about finding one? Say so in the textbook under sex. Area 8. You ask questions of people you encounter. You encounter people all the time. So if you're interested in someone and they're interested in you, now it's question time. That's all. You go about asking questions. What questions? Unlimited questions. Everything that you'll ever want to know. And you ask these questions before you get anywhere close to a bed. So that when you find and wind up in that bed with each other, it's not anything that you will ever ask that you don't already know about that person that you're with. That's number one. That's right out the gate. That'll keep you busy right there with the questions, I mean. That's how you go about doing it according to the code. You don't go anywhere near a bed with that sex partner because that's where you're going to wind up. But this is going to be a process. Now, you can do it fast or you can do it slow. If you want it done fast, you just do it fast. But you don't. You try not to skip over any questions because once you refuse to answer these questions or both of you agree that you're not going to answer a certain type of questions, then you can't ask these questions later on after the bedroom session. That's according to what is written in the textbook itself. I have it very carefully outlined. I try to came up, come up with at least 150, 170 questions, something like that, that you voluntarily ask or answer. And any questions you decide not to ask, because, you know, some people say, no, I don't answer those type of questions. No, no way am I ever going to say anything to anybody about that. So you can forget that. I ain't going to answer that question ever. Now, once you say that, you can't come up. That question cannot come up again if both of you agree. That's that's just as an example of how the question and answer mm-hmm. thing will go. Both mm-hmm. of you have to agree. It's, it's totally democratic. Nothing in the code book is dictatorial. It's all volunteer. You make up your mind what you want to go with and what you don't want to go with. One of the first people to read my book said, well, it ain't nothing in your guidebook that I feel that I, I need to use that I need at all. I mean, you ain't, you wasted your time writing this stuff. 
because so nothing in there applies to me that I can use. And I told the person who said that, I said, that's exactly the way the book is supposed to work. Mm-hmm. You pick out what you want. You pick out what you want, mm-hmm. not what Neely Fuller thinks you ought to have. I'm, I'm yes. not nobody's God or nobody's huh. leader. You pick out what you want, and you do the mm-hmm. same thing with that individual that you're talking to that you want to be serious with, that exactly. you're going to have sex with. That's the procedure. Right. Go to the sex area, the eighth area of the code book, and it's in there, a whole bunch of questions that you ask. Some of them are pretty rough, all right? But mm-hmm. rough questions are what you want to. You don't want to skip over none, in my mm-hmm. opinion, because yeah. they're going to come back to bite you. You Lay got on. that right. Special, okay. Thank you, Swa. You know, you know, you know the drill. Uh, Mr. Fuller, everybody I know loves to hear you talk about your military service. And as you were speaking about that, uh, this last situation where, where the gentleman uh, said there wasn't nothing in there for him and, and the response that you gave him, the, 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 the Sarge that you always talk about and people love you to talk about it, about that gentleman did he get a chance to read your book, or did he read it, or, or what? No. He didn't even okay. know I was right one. He, I didn't know I was right one at that oh. time. Okay. And I was glad when he left. I, I woke up one morning, went on duty, and they say, well, he's shipping out. I mean, nobody knew he was going to leave. He shipped out to another unit. Mm-hmm. And I said, good riddance. I'm tired <laughs> of him being on my case. But in retrospect, he taught me something very essential, and that is don't lie to yourself, Fuller. Don't mm-hmm. lie to yourself. You've been lying to yourself right up to this point, and I'm going to wake you up from that. Mm. You want to believe things that are not true. Mm. And okay. that was true. A lot of black people are like that. We want yeah. to believe things that are absolutely not true. Uh-huh. Black people all we talk about keeping it real more than anybody. You keep but real, we are yeah. not realistic yeah. people at all. <laughs> Nowhere yeah, we near. Sh- we sure know how to it- say it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um let me see here. Loop. Those are my play by play announcing days coming out here. Uh let's go to Adam. Adam says this, uh, Mr Fuller, the Queen of England has arguably maintained a system of racism for decades, and no one has talked about it. How can we get the Queen, or how can we get Queen Elizabeth, a powerful white supremacist, to practice justice and set precedents? You can ask her, what does she think about race? Always go to the people who can ask. The people that you ask about, always go to those people that you're asking about for the answers to your questions and see what they say. If I was going to have the audience with the queen and I had anything to say to her at all, it would probably be about race. So I would ask her, what does she think about the system of white supremacy and her part in it? Yeah. See what her answers. See what her answers are. You know, (laughs) I'd be straight up, knowing me, at this stage of my existence. Oh, yeah. Huh. And, and I would let everybody know this is what I'm going to ask the queen. So don't have yeah. me go in there and sit down and ask her, because I'm going to ask her. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm not going to sit there talking about this, that, and the other, and, you know, and uh, what kind of coach is she going to ride next week? I mean, <laughs> I'm going to yeah. ask her about the biggest problem on the planet. Absolutely. Of which a whole lot of people who speak English, or try to speak it, like I try to do, got to yeah. speak English. Yeah, like a, yeah. I'd like to ask her about Queen Charlotte. How, how, how come they keep that hidden? Yeah. And she was dark. Yeah, I'd like to ask her a couple of questions. Oh, any, anything. Anything <laughs> yeah. that has to do with race. Why? Because racism is the biggest problem on the planet. So if a, a lady who is supposed to be a monarch and supposed to have a lot of knowledge and understanding and have people bowing down to her and practically worshiping her, standing in the rain just to see her go by in a coach, I mean, I would say that, hey, you've got that kind of welfare system going for you. I mean, uh, 
madam, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. your yeah. highness, or whatever she wants to be called, I say now, uh, what what advice would you give me in dealing with this race problem? And what can you do in your position to solve it, the biggest problem on earth, while you're riding around in all these fine clothes and whatnot? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Whew. Yeah, <laughs> they got a lot of problems in that family, especially on the dark. Well, black I mean, side. for one thing, let's look at royalty. That's what it's called. Yeah, royalism. You got capitalism, communism, royal, uh, royalism, all socialism, of uh, the, all of the isms. Yeah. Well, royalism. What is it? It means somebody who is at a higher level than everybody else. Mm-hmm. But when you look. At all royal people, kings and queens, you ask questions. What system is royalism? Where do they get their finances? And when you look at it, it's a welfare system. Queen Elizabeth is on welfare. (laughs) But see, it's a big check. These, you know, different checks, different people on welfare, they get different amounts of money. But she's just drawing a big welfare check, that's all. I don't know of anything that Queen Elizabeth has ever produced. <laughs> it ain't justice, that's for sure. So they say you ain't working. That's welfare. Stop and think about it, folks. Royalism is welfareism. This is a fancy name for high class welfare. Mm. If you want to give that type of title to it. According to what? Neely Fuller? No, no. Nothing is ever according to Neely Fuller in counter racist science. According to logic. Or in compensatory science. Mm-hmm. It's according to logic. Stop That's and right. look at all the kings and queens. Stop and look at to people like Columbus, for instance. I've given that as an illustration. Columbus didn't have any money. Christopher no. Columbus. Mm-hmm. So he went to what? King uh, Ferdinand and Queen Isabella. Yes. So my eighth grade teacher told me. And said, I need some money. Some mm-hmm. Money for what, Chris? I want to explore the world. I mean, I think the world might be round instead of flat. Okay, well, that's a gamble, but, you know, everybody knows it's flat, but you want to take this gamble, and you come to us and you want some money? Yeah, I might find something out there, like gold or something. There might be some other lands out there. And say, well, if you do, if we put our money up, you better bring some back to us. Yep. So now, now. When I first heard that story, I didn't think about it until way after I'd gotten, you know, in and out of the army and everything else and started writing my book. I said, where did the king and queen get their money? People talk about capitalism and all like this and communism. I said, where did Queen Isabella get money for to finance Christopher Columbus with his boats? Okay, three of them he wanted. And I said, they went around with their soldiers knocking on doors saying, you got three goats here, we're going to take two of them for the queen or the king. That's robbing. That's what they do. They call it taxes. Okay. That's what they call it. But the thing about it, the king and queen wasn't producing nothing. Ferdinand or Isabella, what did they produce? They didn't have any factories. He's just riding around telling people what to do. That's welfare. Yeah, it's a, and it's welfare. also robbery. Because they're All forcing that. people at sword point. Yep. <laughs> Here's a farmer. He's out there doing all the heavy lifting out there. He happened to have three goats. So that soldier, that knight in armor, looks over there and says, You got three goats. We're taking two of them for the king, in the name of the king and the queen. Hmm. Yeah, we so take that's it. how they accumulated enough to do what? 
financed Columbus, who, they when did. he got where he was going, how did he raise his capital? By robbery. Robbery. That's how, That's you know, when you start thinking, we're talking about capitalism now, and they start talking about black people all need to be capitalists. You mean you want us to do more robbing and stealing? Like all of y'all got your capital? <laughs> now, we wow. rob and steal on a low level, but you rob and steal whole continents, Chris. Chris. Yeah, Chris. I'm going to take a break, Chris. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's a good one, Chris. You're listening to the Counter Racist Code Show, CRCS, here on ProduceJustice.com and also BlockTalkRadio.com. And we thank you for listening. We have approximately 29 more minutes left in the program if you would like to get in contact with the show, as Sam and Jermaine have done. Hopefully, we'll get to you. Just call this number 516453. 9921. Let me say it slowly. 516 Press the number one button and you'll get in line. And when your name is called, Mr. Bobby will push the button and it does its thing and then you'll be on with Mr. Fuller. Please give your name to the um, call screener so I can get you on. And uh, we can go from there and you can ask Mr. Fuller a question. Please, ma'am, please, sir, make it short. Okay, because as you know, Mr. Fuller uses logic. For those that don't understand what I'm saying, cause and effect. Why? Because we don't want you to be confused. Because we all need to do this to produce constructive results. And you're going to hear that too. So we stay focused on that. By the way, Mr. Fuller will be on the Carl Nelson Show. Yes, Thursday, Thursday, 324. At 5 p.m. till 7 on W-O-L, 1450 a.m. and 95.9 on the FM. Make sure you tune into that. But if you can't get it on there, hey, Robert Moonpie, maybe Sharon and whoever else is involved in it, got that bad boy on at ProduceJustice.com, our Facebook entry. You get on that, baby, and you can hear Mr. Fuller. And it works, too. Thank you for all those that are involved with that. That's the official website, by the way, from Mr., uh, for Mr. Fuller at ProduceJustice.com. Produce Go through there. Everything on there is what Mr. Fuller has said because there's been some things that are going on anyway. We're not even going to go there on that one. But anyway, that's where you can get the latest, the truth, the truth. You can get it right there. All righty. Okay, you can do that. I like that last dissertation, Mr. Fuller, that you were in. It reminded me of what gangsters call a quid pro quo. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. All righty. Don't touch me. Sam, Colorado. Okay, you're in. How you guys doing? Um, Go ahead, Sam. You're on. Can you hear me? Yeah, except for that background noise is kind of interfering. Okay. Uh, how about now? Is yeah. that is that better? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Okay. All right. So my question, Mister Four, is: uh, so you suggest uh, that white people and non-white people not uh, have sex, right? Um, so my question is, what if, you know, someone, what if a non-white and a white person already, you know, got married and had a baby, uh, and then came across your, your book, what do you suggest they do? Oh, a couple of non-white people have a baby. What do I suggest they do? Well, non-white and a white person non-white and a white person had a baby. Is that what you said? Yes. A non-white person had a baby with a white person. Is that what you said? Yes, that's correct. And what do they do? Yes, that's my question. Is that the what question? do they do? 
if, if they if they came across your book, they read it. They in other words, a so-called it, interracial yeah. couple has a baby. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What they do, since that is something that should not have been done, really, but since it has been done, the law of compensation and the code says, well, something is done, something is done. So you make the best of your situation. You try to do what? What everybody else who is not in that situation does. Make sure that you don't mistreat anybody. Because that's all you're here on the planet for anyway, according to the code. It's real simple. And try to help the people that need help the most, including that baby that you produced, which needs help the most. And you explain that you're in this situation, and you're in it, and it can't be undone. So you do, under the law of compensation, the next best thing. Nobody's supposed to condemn you for it, even though you're in a situation that you shouldn't have gotten in. But that applies to all black people. All black people are in a situation they shouldn't have gotten in, and that's without exception. So that's why I'm saying black people don't even have a license to criticize other black people about their circumstances. Why? Because they don't have control over their circumstances. None of us. The white supremacists have control over all of our circumstances. So if somebody wants to blame somebody, blame the white supremacists. We have never known any other guide other than the white supremacists. And that's the truth. It's not nearly full of talking. That's the truth. And anybody who wants to escape the truth will just say that that ain't so. But then once you say that under the law of compensation, what is the truth? What is the truth? So in answer to your question, you just do what every other black person does who's in that situation. Thousands of black people, millions maybe, in that situation or are the result of that situation. You do the best you can day to day. Best you can how? Whatever you can do that's not going to harm anybody and try to do the most constructive thing that will produce the most constructive results. Help yourself first, and then help the person like that baby that needs help. Thank you. All righty. Thank you there, Sam. And don't be a stranger. Okay, let's go to, it says here, Pittsburgh, all right, Jermaine, let me see if I can get you in. Jermaine, gotcha. Go ahead, Jermaine. You're on with Mr. Fuller. What is your question? Jermaine? Okay, wait a minute. Okay, there you go. Yeah, Jermaine, go ahead. There, wait a minute. Yeah, okay, now, there you are. Yeah, Jermaine? Hello? Yeah, go ahead. You're on with Mr. Fuller. Watch out that background noise. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Um, you know what? I was just going to ask, like, uh, um, first of all, like, I just, like, recently found, like, um, Mr. Nelly Fuller, and I appreciate, like, you know, like, just finding that because I think racism is the biggest problem, you know, on um, the planet. So, and I'm Muslim, and um, racism, you know, from Satan was, like, the first racist, according to Islam. So, like, I really appreciate this because it's something that needs to be fought. And I, one of the questions that I wanted to ask was, like, how do you uh, get people from stop from stealing your ideas at work? Like, I might come up with an idea, like, you know, and somebody else might steal it. And I was just wondering, like, what is the best way to do that? What is the best way to, like, um, what's the to, like, best uh, way? What's the best way to handle somebody? You come up with an idea and the person tries to steal your idea? Right. Yeah, exactly. It happens all the time. Like, and they don't give you no credit. You know, like, you come up, might come up, you might have a conversation with Ask somebody. Questions. That's how you, that's, okay. that, oh, go, go ahead. Is something else you want to say? No, and I was just going to say, like, you know, because uh, 
I listen to your program and I, I do find like people like um, go through like the same questions. And I was, I had heard you say about the um, reparations that uh, like that it should be treated like an insurance claim, you know? So like, and I had told that to people and I had used your name, you know, like that. And I thought that was like a great idea because like just cutting a check, you know, it's kind of cheap, you know? So like having a, um, like, you know, going back and treating it like, like looking at all the nine areas of, uh, you know, uh, the nine areas that you talk about and like going through that and seeing where black people was like, uh, oppressed that and then like going through that and like treating it like an assurance, you know, and I, I was just wondering, like, sometimes, I'm trying yeah, to wrap my mind talking. around what is your exact question. <laughs> so, uh, what, the one of the questions I wanted to ask was like, uh, how do you get people to stop stealing your ideas at work? That's that's okay. one of the questions. I want to okay. Share. How do you get people to stop doing yeah. what? Stealing, stealing your stealing your ideas at work. You know, like you might come up with an idea, and like. I would say, like, a, maybe, like, white people will steal your ideas, and, like, you see them implement it, and you're like, I came up with that idea, <laughs> you know, and somebody else is taking credit for no, it. So either you did okay. come up with the idea or not. Okay, now, if you came up with the idea and a person does what? See, we're talking about a person doing something, and you are saying stealing the idea by doing what? What did the person do? What did the, person, the whole audience going to understand Yeah, what did the person do with your idea, Jermaine? Okay, so, like, you know, like, say, like, I come up with, like, something like I work in, like, I, I'm a former military, too, Army, and I, I come up, like, with an idea, like, I work in supply now. Like, you know, and I come up with an idea to, like, basically, like, um, simplify the way that you can go into the supply room and basically, like, look at things without – having to look all around, like, basically, like, you could have, like, like... Uh, oh, okay, in other words, you, you came up with an idea of how to do something better in a supply yeah. situation. That to is what you easy. did, right? Okay, good. Yeah. Go ahead. See, I'm Just trying go ahead. to get it straight about what you did. You see, everything in clarification <laughs> is about clarity. Yeah. Okay. We don't want confusion. Your idea is you walk into a supply room... You figured out how to do something better than it's being done, and you told somebody about how to do it better. Is that clear? Uh, wait a minute. Is that clear, Jermaine? Uh, yes, yes. Okay, okay. Okay, All right, okay. Mr. <laughs> See, we need clarity here and focus. Okay. All right. So somebody, allegedly, from what you're saying, if I understand, said the same thing you said and took credit for it. Is that what you're saying? Wait a minute. Like, okay. okay because the, the idea, like, you know, it never came up until I said anything. You know what I mean? Like, if I see stuff being implemented after I say it. You know, and and it's been like that for years. Like, you know, the supply room's been like that for years. Like, exactly what I, I, yeah. I, you just if I understand, you're saying the same thing I just said. I'm just trying to make it clear right. for the world audience so we don't have, what, exactly. confusion. You came up with an idea about something being done in a warehouse. Next thing yeah. you know, someone has put your idea in the execution and didn't mention your name. Is that what you're right. saying? Exactly. And what okay. do you do about it? That's the question, yes. right? Okay. Now, you see, it, 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 we take a long way around, but, I mean, we get there. Okay. All right. <laughs> but we can take the shortcut. You came up with an idea. The people where you work took your idea, gave it to somebody. They put it in the implementation, and you weren't in any way, as far as everybody's concerned, involved in that idea. That is a form of theft, according to the code. And the code says, don't steal. So, but you don't accuse nobody of stealing. You ask, where did that idea, that idea come from? All problems are solved through what? According to the code. 
questions and answers. So you go to the people who have actually implemented the idea and said, who gave you, where did you all get the idea to do that? Because that idea came from me. I'm informing you. Now, did anybody inform you that that idea come from me? Came from me. You just go and ask. And see what they say. And if they say, it came from you, you no, we gave Ralph an award and a promotion. Because Ralph said that was his idea. And then you ask a question. Would you call Ralph in? And we're going to ask these same questions. Because I, I remember telling Ralph about my idea. The way I remember it. And maybe Ralph can get it straight. Now that we have all agreed to talk about it. Because Ralph got the award or the promotion or whatever it was. Or got some type of plaque saying that he did it. And we in this establishment, in this place where we all work, always want to first of all tell the truth. Is that true or false? We all work here. We are a team. And we always tell each other the truth about anything connected with the job. Am I to understand that that's the case? Yes or no? See, that's the question you put yeah. forward. That's the question you put forward with the president of the company there. We in this company always tell each other the truth, correct? You ask the yeah. president of the company that, all right? That's how you do it. If, if it gets that high, you might say. That's the compensatory procedure. See, I did this type of thing when I was on the job. I didn't start off doing that. But I said, hey, I'm going to codify this. <laughs> Whatever this mess came up right now, this is going to be codified by tomorrow morning. I'm going I'm going home tonight and brainstorm this. Show right. And by tomorrow morning, I'm going to have a code for it. And I'm coming in with that code. Uh, the director of the building where I work <laughs> used to comment <laughs> On, he said, oh, we'd have an assembly of people around the table, and we'd all come in and take our seats. And they say, well, I see Neely Fuller had his pad out. Because, <laughs> see, I'm going to write down stuff that you say. I'm going to pick out things that you say. And five years later, I'll remind you of what you said and give you the date and time. Black people, that's a part of the code. We need to learn to do that. I had to learn yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All righty. Thank Chicken you. Uh, on the roof. <laughs> uh -huh. Thank you, Jermaine. Appreciate it. Don't be a stranger. Do not be a stranger. Mr. Fuller, let's just do this. Let's talk about your book here while we have a few minutes here. Go ahead, please, sir. Yes. The book is about basically... Problem solving, and the biggest problem on the planet is the problem of racism in the form of something called, in capital letters, the system of white supremacy. And I want to reiterate, getting toward the end of this program, I'm going to keep saying it because I keep hearing people do it, and it pains me every time I hear uh, TV hosts, uh, uh, people on the radio, people... Uh, that I listen to, mostly on the radio and on television. Uh, I see people saying this word, America, and I'm talking about the book now. Uh, the book is supposed to clear up our language. Don't ever accuse America of doing anything that shouldn't be done. Why? Because it's not true, that's why. And why is it not true? Because America, or Americans, American people, they do not exist. So that is not telling the truth when you say Americans did anything. 
America is an idea. So the people who practice Americanism are an idea that's never been achieved. Because what is that idea? The idea of justice. It's never been achieved anywhere on the planet in recorded history by anybody. So since the word America itself, in essence, means people who don't do unjust harm to people and people who need help, who need it the most, who, who give help to people who need help the most in the most constructive manner, always constructive, never destructive, these people do not exist anywhere on the planet. So now the textbook for white supremacy says that there is a system that you always charge with doing something that it shouldn't be done, and that is the system of white supremacy. It's the most powerful government on the planet. There's no government, no religion more powerful than the religion and the government of the system of white supremacy, and call it by that name. Don't call it by any other name except the system of white supremacy in capital letters in neon lights, night and day, 24-7. And don't mix it up with all these other capitalism and all the rest of it. No, the system of white supremacy. That's the only government on the planet, and that's been the government. Now, the textbook for victims of white supremacy is supposed to be designed to help the individual person to eliminate that system and replace it with the system that the whole world should, should come under, and that's the system of justice, which means guaranteeing that no person on this planet is supposed to be mistreated, guaranteeing that that doesn't happen, and guaranteeing that the person that needs help the most gets the most constructive help in every area of activity, economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war. That just about covers just about everything that people are involved in throughout the planet 24 hours a day. We want that type of world. We want the whole world to change, not just bits and pieces change here and there. And that 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 slogging we have, we have been doing, including all the white people, of going about doing things. We need a complete package, and we need it overnight. It can't be a long, drawn-out thing. Or it, well, it probably will have to be, but... It needs to be accelerated. And the textbook for victims of white supremacy is supposed to be the first step in doing that for the non-white people, since it seems like the white people have sold themselves and the rest of the world on white supremacy forever, where it hasn't done the job of producing justice. So this book is supposed to be designed to help us to do the job of producing justice for the first time on planet Earth. I don't know about other planets, but you got to start here. You know, people talk about exploring our outer space, but you can okay. get the book by going to ProduceJustice.com. Oh, ProduceJustice.com. ProduceJustice.com. And we can stop sloganeering and put some substance in these books that tell us what to do, what not to do, on a daily basis, each yes, and every sir. minute, every time you open your mouth, what to say, what not to say, and how to well, say it. That's what the book it. is for, and okay. what to do and what not to do. ProduceJustice.com. Okay. From the Gmail, Nawab says, please realize that when some of us suggest making health the 10th category and uh, air and of area of human activity that it really should be medicine or medical parenthesized instead. Medicine should be medicine yeah, medicine should be uh med, medicine should be that tenth category if you ever decided to add another one, which I know you want at this point. But the white supremacists use these medical industry in a nefarious ways against the non white 
black population and has done so historically. That is not the same as health, which can be conveniently put under economics, the economics umbrella. Medicine is its own separate category, just as religion, uh, politics, education, labor, law, religion, and entertainment are. And I know when Mr. Bobby finishes reading my VGQ, you will say all nine areas of activity intersect and overlap each other. And I see what you mean, but just wanted to make it known to you, Mr. Bobby, and the listening audience to use medicine instead of when referring to the unofficial 10th area of human activity. Okay, that was from uh, Nawab. Okay, last call of the day. RT, St. Louis, very quickly, you're on with Mr. Fuller. Go ahead, please. Yeah, just a brief comment. Uh, you know, Mr. Fuller, uh, I think it's kind of funny when you, uh, you know, you, you've, you've mentioned about black men saying that uh, they have a girlfriend or a wife, and you said uh, you're in, you're in the system of white supremacy, if you're black, you're in prison first. You, it, that's all in your head that you've got a wife, and, and you even mentioned that uh, even on the bottom of the slave ships, uh, black men were saying that they were married. Uh, you know, my wife is over there on the other side of the slave ship chained up, but once they got there to where they were going, the captain of the ship uh, told your wife, suppose wife, that she's going down the road and you're going to stay here with me. So all this about us being married, that the white supremacists has got all that just in our heads. And like you said, we're, we're in prison first. So I just wanted to make that comment. All righty. Um, all righty, uh, R.T. and uh, St. Saint Louis. Hope you've got some good ribs down there, too. Okay, Mr. Fuller, we're uh, at about two minutes left in the show. It is yours before I close this bad boy out. Go ahead, Mr. Fuller. Well, I'm just saying a lot of the things that have been touched on in my book, this touches on problems, really, because there are thousands, millions of problems that people face every day. But everything is supposed to be, everything in the book that I put out here, I've tried to point to it. That's the main thing to think about when you get up in the morning and go to bed at night. What problem did I solve today? What problem did I solve? And if you didn't solve a problem, it means, according to the code, you somehow missed the boat for this day. And that time was not well applied. So that's kind of rough. I wake up every morning and go to bed at night. And I don't solve problems, but I'm attempting to. But if we set that as our criteria, black people become known all over the world. There's people who are always trying to solve a problem. They wake up in the morning and go to bed at night trying to solve problems that, in a way that produces a constructive result. The black people are all about constructive results. Every move that they make is about constructive results. I mean, they, they worship constructive results. And I think that will fulfill the mission of the textbook for victims of white supremacy. All righty. ProduceJustice.com. Okay. With that being said, we have finally reached the finish line. So I want to say thank you, callers, for all of your calls. Thank you, chatters, for all the chat room. Uh, Gmailers, thank you. But most of all, thank you, Mr. Fuller, uh, for um, what you do with and helping us to stay focused and uh, be logical for that constructive result. So thank you. Producers, you did another marvelous job, and we hope to do this again uh, next week. So final 30-second word for you, Mr. Fuller. Just set this producejustice.com. Okay, you heard it. All the material, producejustice.com. Don't forget, Fuller on the Carl Nelson Show on this Thursday, 5 till 7. And you can get it right here at producejustice.com at our Facebook page. Everybody have a good, good, good week. Thank you.